It is Wednesday afternoon. It is August 16th. We're picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 25. Quick review where we talked about the descendants of Ishmael. In, that started in verse 12. Remember Avraham, we had to say goodbye to him for a while. He's uh, gone to be with his forefathers, those who had faith also. He's in what is called Sha'ol in the paradise side, the uh, nicknamed even Avraham, Abraham's bosom. We talked a lot about that last week, so I'll not review it now. But uh, he lived a, a full life, was satisfied, was called a friend of God. I mean, what an example we have set before us. And we see even in our humanity, our mm. ups and downs, God isn't through with us. He continued to work with Avraham. He'll continue to work with us. His sons, Yitzhak, the son of promise, Ishmael, the son from Hagar, the hand, handmaid that he picked up down in Egypt, that Sarah gave to him and said, better help God have a son. <laughs> Wait, whoops, and I didn't silence my own phone. Wow, okay. <laughs> Worry about everyone else's and not your own. Sorry, folks. Anyway, uh, these two sons came together at this time. They're older now, and they came together to bury their father. Um, we did also see last time, and I want to clarify, we talked about Keturah, the wife that Abraham took after this, you know, probably about three years after Sarah had uh, passed away. Um, this is probably about 65 years since he picked up Hagar, and we have all that went on. As we look at the timing of the ages and all, we can see that. So very likely she was probably the daughter of one of the handmaids that came out of Egypt. Um, and being in Abraham's family, growing up in that entire family, she would have heard about the one true and living God. And even as we saw last week, Hagar had faith in the living God of Israel. Ishmael apparently did also because when it said that he died, he also was gathered to his people, to his fathers before him which indicates to us that, that he went into the paradise side. Uh, but we were talking about where did she come from? Uh, very likely the daughter of one of the Egyptian maids that came out of Egypt when Avraham and Sarah had gone down into Egypt against what God wanted and he brought them back up out of Egypt. So then we looked at Ishmael's um, descendants. We saw that we look first at the line that is not going to be the Messianic line. This is, I'll put it this way, it's the rejected line, but I don't mean it in the people all are being rejected, is that they were not in that promised line uh, that is so important. And this is typical in scripture. We'll see that line that's, that's rejected, talked about first, and then we don't hear about them anymore. And we go on with that promise line. So we saw that through the line of Ishmael, we have many of what we know as the Arab nations today. Uh, Roger, if you want to put up the maps, we saw that they settled in Edom, that Petra is in Edom. Uh, we're going to see the name Edom pop up with Esau also. We're going to find a, a very close relation there. There we go. So. Um, on the right side of the green, going down, you see the kingdom of Moab, that's Edom area. One of my other maps might even say it, Nabataean tribes, there we go, we talked about them last week also, they're, yeah, there you go, Roger circling it, and there's the kingdom of Edom, that whole area. It, you can even see Petra on this map, right, very bottom, 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 straight down the middle, there you go, right there. Okay, so this is the area that we're talking about that many of the descendants of Ishmael took it up in these places. We also will see it called Arabia, and I think the next map will show that. There was a northern Arabian caravan. It would go from Egypt, which is down south here, a little, a little below what you're seeing on this map, and it will go over to my right, your left, um, Okay, Egypt's here on your left. Saudi Arabia had some of the area that we've already talked about, but the, this uh, Nabataean, um, I'm sorry, Arabian caravan went from Egypt to Assyria. Assyria's up north and east. There you go, Iraq, Iran is going to is going to go in through that area. Notice before he takes this map away, just above Iraq, the name Iraq, you can see Tigris. 
and then to the left, my left, your right, Roger, well, no, your left, Roger, also, it's Euphrates. See the two rivers? There you go, there's Tigris, and now go left. Uh-oh, you took it away. Yeah. <laughs> he jumped. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Uh, we've got to find a way to, there we go. Now you can see the boat near the, near the name Syria. Okay, that area, we're going to talk about that area right there between the two rivers a lot in the next few minutes. Uh, go ahead and go to my next map and see but if it gives us a way up there, huh? Yes, it's okay. north and east. See where Turkey is? Turkey also. Um, before you take that map away, Roger, mm -hmm. it, it's perfect. If you, if you look, if everybody's looking straight onto the map, then on the left at the bottom, you see the name Israel. Okay, there's Israel right there. Haifa, that's right above Israel. There's Jerusalem. Now you can see that. Okay. That's where Abraham and the family are. They're in Israel. You go straight up, you have Lebanon. There you go. That's where the trouble is today. That's the same Lebanon as today. <laughs> I'm going to give Dora and anyone else who wants a chance to get over where they can see the map better. Is that above or below Syria? Uh, Lebanon is just below. Syria is a little north and a little east. <laughs> But in today's world, Syria is running over Lebanon right now. And in all honesty, Iran, which you see all the way over on the right, is doing a lot of what's going through Syria, through Lebanon, onto Israel's border, causing trouble today. So it's, it's a preeminent area in today's world also, and those areas are still the same. The borders might be slightly different, but not enough to worry about. So again, uh, the area that we're going to talk about right now is between Syria, okay, now go just to the right, there's Euphrates, and there's the Tigris, okay, those are two, the two main rivers, we're going to talk about the land in between, okay, that caravan that I was mentioning would go all the way down below Israel, south, there you go, there's your Red Sea, and you've got the Sinai Peninsula, you've got just to your left, that star over there, that right star, that's Cairo, the, you're in Egypt there. So the caravan would go from Egypt, go up north, probably through Israel. I don't know if exactly because I didn't study that, mm -hmm. but I would imagine and up through Lebanon, Syria, and then to the east. That would be the area that they were going. So this Egypt and Assyria connection, because that area where we're calling it Syria and Iraq and some of Iran, that's the area that was called Assyria when Assyria is finally a nation. When we talk about um, Abraham, Abraham being a Syrian, it's because he came from that area in there, the Syrian area. We're going to give it a couple other, a little more accurate names, but he came, the Mesopotamia area is where those two rivers are, in that area also. Um, so I think that gives you the whole layout that you need. Uh, when I talk about Aramean, the uh, uh, Padan Aram, um, the Aram, I forget how it says it, but between the Aram, it, it's talking about between the two rivers. That's why I'm focusing especially on there for today. Um, the Euphrates, and if it was not the Tigris, the next map should show a river real close in that same area called the Habar, or it's either C-H-E-B-A-R or H-A-B-O-R, depending on who's translating it. Um, this one is not showing it, but it's showing you Assyria. See the area of Assyria? Right above Tigris on the map, same area that we were in. That's where you saw Iran a minute ago. Okay? So if you've got one more, sure, because I never remember what all I did. Does this one show? I thought I had one that showed. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Stop, freeze it. Perfect. Okay, see the name Assyria. That's your landmark for where you just were, so you understand what we're talking about. Notice that right below it is Ashur. That's, that's the name of a city or a whatever, you know, on a <coughs> river that's on the, Euphra on the Euphrates. Sorry, <laughs> trying to talk fast. Then notice just below that it says Habor River and it's pointing to the left. Okay, Tigris River. Oh, I, Euphrates, sorry. Tigris and Euphrates are both still a little over. Euphrates is the big one. Tigris and Euphrates? No, Euphrates, see it in Arabian Desert, it's pointing to Euphrates. There you go, you're on the Euphrates. Okay. So right, it could that. refer to the Euphrates and the Habor, 
or it could refer to Euphrates and the Tigris, which this map is not showing you Tigris, but it's all that area. And I'm not even sure that I can tell you without some extensive study why. Okay, and here's now you can see Tigris. Go straight up from Habar. Right there. Habar, yeah, and see the Tigris. So see Tigris on your right, Euphrates on your left, Habar in the middle of them, the two of them. Whichever of the two rivers they're referring to, that was the name given to it, Aram, between the two rivers, okay? Sometimes I guess it was meaning between Tigris and Euphrates, sometimes it was meaning between Habor and, and Tigris. Yes, Dora? Uh, but these two rivers are not, not in Israel. No. Not in Jerusalem, no. Israel. No, Israel's all the way over on our left now. Yeah, yeah there you go. You can see Israel would be, uh, see where it says Jerusalem? Jerusalem? There, there you go. Yeah. Yes. So no, they're north and east of Israel. That remember, Abraham traveled, what was it, 450 miles or close to 500 miles to go from Mesopotamia to Israel. So, and it was called Canaan or Canaan at that time. So yes, that gives you your, your traveling distance. And of course, that was him traveling as you could on foot. A bird but could fly across. from Mesopotamia way up here yes. down this way. Yes. So how far is it across? As the crow flies, uh -huh. I'd have to look up. Oh, it'd, be, okay. it'd be much shorter. Because uh, he came this way too, or when he came this way, then he went down to Edom and stuff like that. Egypt. He went down yeah, to Egypt, Egypt, yes. And that's, that's south. Remember, he starts and we talk about some of the areas in the north. Then we had him down in Beersheba, that's below Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Then he went down, all the way down into Egypt, that's continuing on below. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, and I'm noticing my scale of 300 miles, see yeah. my scale on the right? Oh. By my eyeball, I'm going to say that maybe it was 300 miles, maybe 350 miles if he went as the crow would fly. Just just get a rough estimate mm -hmm. right now from what I'm seeing from the map, but about 450 to 500 miles by foot because, wow. uh, you know, they, they had to go where they could go. But you see how much of it was desert area <coughs> that they would be coming through, you know, and that's what the caravans would do, and, you know, that was hard. But they, they managed, they had ways, and why, of course, the camel would be the desert horse, because the camel in their hump can hold all that water that can get them across the desert where a horse would not survive. Yeah, I think they only wore sandals. <laughs> and that's why they only wore sandals. <laughs> no, I mean, think they only wore sandals. I never see, we never hear about anything other than sandals. You don't really hear sandals either. Do I, think, I think they just did, sandals was, yeah. was it. Easy just thing. something that would get them off of the heat of the desert sand, but leave the foot exposed as much as possible. And for our children of Israel, when they wandered in the wilderness, their sandals never wore out because God took care of them. Pretty amazing. So, I'm sorry? It's a good brand. <laughs> good brand. I'd like to buy it today. God, your souls. You're a good your souls, and they God your souls. Roger's saying instead of good your souls, God your souls. <laughs> Anyway, okay, are we clear on the map? Are we good in the, the living room? We Everybody's clear? Got it in your minds? Okay, bring me back my Zoom room and let's see if they're good. I hope you did share. Tell me you shared. With well, my... Yeah, we were sharing. Good, okay. So <laughs> Zoom room, good. Any questions? Okay, okay, cool. All right, hopefully that helps. It's a good lesson for, for me, even I need the refreshment of it. Uh, some of the people I didn't just mention now, I did quickly say Edom. We have the Edomites, uh, we have the Arabians, we have the Nabataeans. These are all Arab-associated names. We didn't talk about the two that went just east of Israel. That area would be Jordan. Down below would be Edom, Moab and Edom. Okay? Uh, I think with that I've covered it all. Then we had in verse 17 that Ishmael was gathered to his people. Same wording that was given to Avraham. That's why it's believed that he went into the paradise side. Uh, verse 18, his people that, that kept on coming from him, his, his um, <laughs> what do you call them? Descendants. Um, they, they went from Havilah to Shur. That would put them in North Arabia. We looked at Arabia being that big area. You know, it, it'd be the north part of that huge area. 
Um, and that again was along the main caravan route from Egypt to Syria. Shur is known to be the wilderness just east of the border of Egypt. So if you were low in Israel, way down south where you come to the Egyptian border and you went straight east, you would come to Shur. And then if you go up north through the Arabian Desert, you would come up to Havilah that was north. So that's all on the east side of Israel. They weren't names that you could see on this map. But if you just remember, you know, Israel's here, and then you've got that Saudi Arabia area here, and it's very large. So from down here to up here, that's where his people settled. Okay? Um, and Havilah, in fact, means sandy. It fits. The Arabian Desert is very sandy, so it fits. Um, but we have... One thing of interest, I'm not sure I got it out last time, so here's where I'll pick up and start following through in order. In verse 17, it says, They settled from Havilah to Shur. Did I say 17? Sorry, it's 18. Which is east of Egypt and going toward Assyria. If you kept going up north, you get through Saudi Arabia territory, you're going to come up into that Assyria area where the Tigris and Euphrates and all of that area is. Now, here's what it's saying. He settled in defiance of all his relatives, okay? We've got the sons of Ishmael that, that it's talking about um, there. And when it says that they settled in defiance of all his relatives, that means that, that they're almost defecting from their own family, that there's inner quarreling, that there's struggles that are going on. And um, this, this also, let me just remind you, let's go back to chapter 16 real quick in uh, Genesis chapter 16 and verse, I think it's 25, no, sorry, verse 12. 16 and verse 12, here's when God's telling Hagar, you're pregnant, you're carrying Ishmael, that uh, she, he, she would bear a son in verse 11, call his name Ishmael, because the Lord heard her in her affliction. But here's his description of Ishmael. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. Everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. Well, here what we're just now reading in chapter 25 is the fulfillment of that. He went east of all his brothers. He was contentious with them. And his family continues on further away from the others because he was not getting along with them. Uh, and that was by his natural who he was. Um, so, verse 19, back in chapter 25, verse 19 says, Now these are the records of the generations of Yitzhak. And if you remember last time I was bringing to your attention again, when we have that word generation, Hebrew is toldot. I think I said toldot last time. Toldot is a little more correct in my pronunciation. That means generation. And what we're being told here is, here's the history of Isaac of Yitzhak. We're going to get his line now. And remember, he is the promised son, the promised line. So this is the line that, that is of great importance. Now, because of the way that's written, and I've brought this out and I'll continue to as we go on through Genesis, that's like a signature. So basically what's probably happening here is that the records that we've had from the last time we saw this in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 27 up to this point, that was probably what was penned during, um, it, it deals with Abraham, it deals with Isaac, a portion of Isaac's life, and it's probably what Isaac wrote out. Now we're going to go on, we're going to get past Isaac into Jacob, and the next time we see that phrase connected with Jacob is probably what Jacob penned. So Isaac kept the records up to here. Now Jacob's going to carry on the records, and it keeps going down that way. Again, Moshe's given credit for writing all of the first five books because he is the final author. He wove together the records. He brought the continuity. It was through him that God was making sure every word was inspired and inerrant. But here, breaking it down, we have the help that he used. That, that they kept records, and these are the records that were kept. Yes, Rhonda? Help her, Roger? Okay. Her, earlier, we were saying that um, Hagar and Ishmael um, had faith in the living God. 
right? Yes, I believe they did. Uh, so when people say, people say that Christians, Jews, and Muslims worship the same God. Okay. Christian. I struggle with that because Christians. You know, Christianity, you got to go through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes. Through them, you got to go through their God. Right? Okay. The the and Jews and Christians have the same God, but for them, it seems like it doesn't add up. Okay. Coming down to today, we have the Muslim religion, we have Christianity, and we have Judaism. Judaism worships the God of Israel. Judaism worships the God of our original covenant. Judaism worships Yehovah. Judaism does not recognize Yeshua, Jesus, as God. He was a good rabbi. He was a, a historic character, but he wasn't God. That's Judaism. But when they worship God, when they're trying to be obedient to God, those who are orthodox trying to keep the traditions and the, the commandments of God, that is the very same God that we in Christianity refer to. That's Jehovah. That's Father, Abba. That's um, the Father God in heaven, who Yeshua right now is sitting on the right hand of. Because in Christianity, we see the complete picture. We see that Yeshua is the Son of God. He is very God. He's the only way to God the Father is through His shed blood. That's why He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So Judaism and Christianity both worship the one true living God, the God of Israel. The difference between the two is Judaism, Judaism stopped short of embracing Yeshua Jesus. Christianity, you've got your bed, Judaism, you've got your flower, Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, complete picture. The Muslims of today, when they worship who they call God, the name is Allah. Allah is the moon God. Allah is not the God of Israel. Allah is not the God of, of uh, the, the God I refer to in heaven, Yehovah. He's, Allah is not at the, in the heavenly scene. Allah is not even alive. There's no other God that's alive. The closest that you'll get, and I will not call him a God, is Satan. Because Satan is not a God, he's a created angel. He gets worship, and that's what he wants. So he's in a place like a God where he gets worship, but he's not even a God either. There's no other God. There's only one God, one living God. There's plenty of dead gods, stone gods, you know, whatever's been created, and then there's all kinds of other idolatry. But the Muslims of today are not on the same page with us. And if you go do missionary work to the Muslim world, you have to introduce them to the God of Israel and to Yeshua Jesus. You have to get them to separate from Allah completely. Where when we go to our Jewish people in witness, we embrace the same God, we're worshiping the same God, we just tell them that we believe that there's only one way to God and it's through his son, who is also very God himself, Yeshua Jesus. So there's your breakdown. Back in this time, you had idolatry, you had heathendom, you did not have Muslim religion, Islam. That comes in 6th century AD, approximately. But you don't even have all at this point. Other names, sure. But you don't even have that at this point. Um, the oldest, well, no, I'm not even going to say it because I don't know, I haven't studied. You have gods like the Egyptians worship the god Ra, R-A, that's associated with the sun. Not a far cry for me to see how the Muslim god is the moon god when you've got the sun god. And remember in Paul's day, they worshipped every god because they were afraid that if they didn't <coughs> worship a god, that god would get mad at them and they'd suffer the consequences. So they suffered the sun, I mean, they worshiped the sun god and the moon god and the rain god and the god of nature and the god of the trees and the god of this and the god of that and even put up the, the, the altar to the unknown god just in case if we missed one. This goes for that one. But hallelujah that they did that because that's where Shaul Paul, by wisdom of the Holy Spirit, jumped in and said, let me introduce you to the unknown god. And by the way, he is the one and only above and all the rest are beneath. 
and yeah. use that as his launching point. Mm -hmm. I think I saw a question somewhere. Yes, Dora. Okay, uh, well, I was going to ask how many years from Abraham, you know, the God of Abraham, Jacob, to Allah come up? Okay, all is 600 AD. Avraham, we're back in, uh, <coughs> is it 3000 BC? I should know this. Let me Google real fast Avraham's time. No, 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 good question. Uh, Moshe is, is like about 1500, 1400 BC. But Abraham's before that, uh, I want to say 3000. Abraham timeline, here we go. Okay, it's the time frame. One of these ought to give me, uh, that doesn't give it to me. I thought this would be real easy to Google. <laughs> Okay, life. Okay, now they're saying 1960 BC. So let's say 2000. I'd have to research to see if I totally agree. But let's say Abraham is 2000 BC, and you know what? That is more accurate than what I was thinking with the 3000. Abraham's about 2000 BC. So let's just call it 2000, and then you have to add on 600 years AD, so 2600 years between Abraham being introduced to the one true and living God of Israel and Muslim coming up and worshiping Allah, the, the moon god and a false god. Okay, about 2,600 years between those two. Does that satisfy? Okay, any other questions? Remember we've got a lot of false religion, but when we talk about those three main, Christianity's dates to the first century AD because no one could be a follower of Christ until he has called that, you know, until he lived his earthly life and ministry. And then the first ones called Christians in that first century, it, it was not nice. It was a derogatory term. It's come to be nice to us in this day and age. But that's when Christianity would begin, the calling out of the church, the called out assembly, the ecclesia that we're part of today had its birth at Shavuot, at Pentecost, 40 days after, well, I'm sorry, 50 days after Yeshua had resurrected from the dead, 40 days after he ascended into heaven, 10 days later, the power of the Holy Spirit came on the first believers, and that's what we call the beginning of the church. So that would be approximately, and trust me, I'm saying only approximately 30 AD. I'm not giving you an exact year there. There's a lot of question as to the accuracy of the calendar to know, uh, but it's most likely that Yeshua was born before the year 1 AD. Even though we say that that's the change of the calendar before Christ and in the year of our Lord, it's not exactly accurate. So that's why um, we know he lived 33 years in his human flesh. I'm just going to round it to 30 AD. Uh, Judaism, its roots go all the way back. If you go from the time of law, then go from the time of Moshe, go from about, we'll say 1445 BC would be the start of what's called Judaism. With Abraham, it's all about promise. God made a promise. God covenanted with Abraham. That's what Abraham by faith believed in the promises that were, the, or the promise of the Messiah that would come. There's no such thing as a Jew yet. There's no such thing as Judaism. This is all prior. So you don't have that development yet. Okay? So Good questions. I can't think of a name that was given other than worshiping the God of Israel. That's all that comes to my mind. That in Abraham's day, that's what separated him. He crossed over, that made him a Hebrew, that meant he crossed over literally the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that you saw, but figuratively he crossed over from the world of idolatry to worshiping the one true and living God. So that's where the, that change comes in that begins with the, the roots that will eventually be called law, Judaism, you know, going forward and we keep going down and we come into what becomes called Christianity, and we still know it's from that one root, 
because the root is Yeshua. The root is Jesus. The root leads us to the Father in heaven, Yehovah. And Yeshua and Jesus, I'm sorry, Yeshua and Yehovah are one, one and the same. Can we understand that? No, no. We take it by faith. We get little glimpses to help us understand. I'm looking at Dave on my um, Zoom room, <laughs> big smile. He's a dad, he's a son, he's an uncle, all right? Yeah, you've got, you're, you've got nieces and nephews. <laughs> he's got three different roles there, but he's one person. That begins to give us an idea. Where it breaks down is Dave can't separate himself. He can't be God the Father on the throne in heaven and Yeshua Jesus on earth at the same time. He can't do, he can't even do two places on earth at once. If you figure out how, Dave, bottle it and sell it. <laughs> but we know we can't. So that's why I say it breaks down. We can't fully, totally comprehend, but it gives us an idea, you know, the, the, where we can see the different roles. Is in my mind, our God being an ineffable God, which means he's too big to fit in one one sentence or one one description, that's where we see. That's why he is so big, so grand, so magnificent, so beyond our human comprehension that that's why he can be God the Father and God the Son at the same time, one and split in a way that shows us the difference and bring in the third part, the Ruch HaKodesh, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and it just blows your mind all the more. But that's our God. And that's why a part of our God in the Spirit is in each one of us who is a believer today. How does he do that? But I can attest to the fact I know he lives. How I know he lives? He lives in me. I know. I know. And I see faces shaking. You know, you're all in agreement. So amazing God and amazing grace, the plan he made to draw all mankind to himself. Okay, any other questions, comments? Good questions, good thoughts. We'll move forward then. And we see, as, uh, as I've already said, that this next section that's really going to go from the end of verse 19 all the way through to chapter 37, that's probably the records that Yaakov, that Jacob kept. Uh, it begins with the statement of Yitzhak's background that fits. If I were to write about my line and my heritage, I wouldn't start with myself. I would say I was born from Mike and Ruth Pearl. So it's very easy to see. He's just, here we are, and he's carrying it on down. It'll continue through his life. It'll follow his marriage. He'll narrate experiences that he's had, and he'll take us all the way down to his son, Joseph, Joseph being in Egypt. Then Joseph's the one who's going to pick up and carry records on down from there. So we think we're so smart keeping our genealogical records today, and we think people didn't know how to write back then. No, there's plenty of proof from clay tablets and all the rest. Writing was all the way back. I believe Adam, Adam, in the garden, well, let's say in his earthly life, okay, because I'm not going to say before the fall, but once the fall has happened, I believe that God gave him the ability to write and to have language. He named all the animals. He was brilliant. I don't see any reason to think that he was not able to put his language down in writing. So you can argue it. That's fine. As long as you come to the same conclusion that what is written for us is inerrant, is trustworthy. There's no fallacies. There's no false beliefs. There's nothing wrong in this scripture. If you come up with any other conclusion other than that, then you and I are off on different pages, and I will argue with you because I'm told all scripture is given by God. It's inspired by God. It is inerrant. It is profitable for instruction, for correction, for uh, edification, education, everything. But that's what matters is if you can find one thing wrong with these scriptures, then I can't trust in the God of my salvation and I'll throw everything out. But no one is able to. Even those who say, oh yes, I can, I can show you, I can show you arguments in scripture, I can show you where it's saying different things. No, if you get into a study in its context and know who he's talking to and what he's talking about, there are no um, arguments between scripture. And that in itself shows us the amazing inerrancy of our scripture over what? 
1,500 years, over 40 authors, all backgrounds, all walks of life, all telling the same story. Wow. Try having a room like ours, have an incident happen, have each one of us write, and especially write a little bit later, and you'll have all kinds of versions. You'll have versions. <laughs> you'll have little differences and the way that people perceive. But see, that's what's about the scripture. It's not how the people perceived. It's what God spoke through them, what God wrote through them, what God used them for was to convey the truth. So um, amazing how it's come. Amazing how it's passed down. And even those who want to argue and say that these were not written by Avraham and by Yitzhak. It was only written by Moshe. If that floats your boat, makes you feel better, fine. I won't argue it. In my Hebrew, I believe I see a difference. But I give you, Moshe has the credit. He's the, the final author and the one that God says that the books were were you know penned by him. So I have no problem with it. I'll move on, but I only say that if you wonder why, because there are those who do argue it, and I just want you to know where we need to take our stand and what we are standing on. I'm standing on an errant word of God. Every word, from Bereshit to Revelation, first word to the last word. So, believing that, let's see what it says. In verse 20, we have that Yitzhak, Isaac, was 40 years old when he took Rivka, Rebecca, the daughter of Beit Yuel, and here you go now, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Levon, Levon the Aramean, to be his wife. Okay, the Aramean, um, I think you all have that. If you have something else and you're confused, let me know. But I think most of the translations use the word Aramean and of Padan Aram. Okay, Aramean means Aram of the two rivers. Okay? So remember those two rivers? If you came from that area, you are called an Aramean. You came from between those two rivers. Mesopotamia is more of the Greek name that we're familiar with and hearing more often because the Greek culture that took over um, the, throughout the world is more predominant of what we hear today. But if you go back to Abraham coming from Ur of the Chaldees, you hear these other more ancient names Aramean is Hebrew, one of the more ancient names, and again it means Aram of the two rivers. The area, the valley of the two rivers is how I would translate it today. If you could say, maybe maybe I should say a field or a plain rather than a valley, because I don't know that it went deep like a valley, but field, plain, valley between the two rivers. Okay, now if it does mean Haran and, I'm sorry, Habar rather than Tigris and Euphrates, you're still in the same area. It's, you know, all in that area, yes. So is that for the, uh, the people, the Aramaeans, get their name? Yes, why they were called that, yeah. yeah. Like we're called today, I'm an American because I live in America. Yes. Would that be what we know now as the Armenians, or is that... I think the Armenians are an offshoot of one of the Arab tribes. So I'm going to say um, Armenia is an actual area that's not where we're saying. So I'm going to say no to that. But they're probably cousins. <laughs> okay. And the map is still there. Okay. I don't think the map shows Armenia at all. I think I'd have to get into a modern day map. And I'm not even on top of my geography where I could say what it's between or I would be telling you right now. But it's easy enough to Google a map of today and see where Armenia is. Yeah. Um, yeah. It might be more over like Okay, or I'm putting it in my mind, Afghanistan area. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry, folks. I'm good with geography when the map's in front of me. <laughs> My recall and my, no, I, I memorized for tests and a month later I didn't know what. But what is the language that uh, the Jewish people or, or, or the Jesus spoke? Okay, or Yeshua Jesus spoke Hebrew. It would be ancient Hebrew, not the Hebrew of today, that's modern Hebrew. He also spoke Aramaic, yes, 
and I'm sure he spoke other languages too. There we go, Azerbaijan. I even thought of that. It flashed through my mind and I, I dismissed it. Roger got it up for us, folks. There's Armenia. That is shared too. Um, and it's shared too. Okay, but can you give us any landmarks around there? I'm looking for anything else I'm familiar with. Uh, you need to go, yeah, get, get me over to. Well, let me back up a little bit. Okay, see, so now's where I get lost. Those of you who are good with maps, is that Turkey? Yeah, it says Turkey. If that means Turkey, then we are going to the right. But I don't put Afghanistan there today. See, this is where I get confused. I'll have to study it out for you folks. There's Greece. There's I can follow that. Yeah. It's a little ways from Greece. You're jumping to Turkey, and then There's you're Egypt. jumping to Armenia. So Egypt's here, yeah. Saudi, Jordan. Okay. And, and Turkey, right? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So it, it put it Armenia. It put it closer, closer to Turkey than I realized. So yeah. it could be the area that some of these were in, especially with that Nabataean caravan route. Yeah, it could have been in that area. So I'll stand corrected. Like I say, I'm not your. I, I'm not on top of geography like I should be. I just don't <laughs> hold on to everything, folks. Sorry. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's too crowded in a little brain. <laughs> okay, so when we talk about Haran and Nahor, the, the brothers of Abraham, um, we talk about them in, in this area between the Euphrates and the Habor, that, that other little river that's there, a little bit north um, from the Euphrates. The Greeks call the area Aram, and by the way, I shorted on that. When we talk, and last week the question was asked also, we talk about the Semitic people. Often people think, because when you hear anti-Semitism, it's almost always referring to anti-Israel, anti-Hebrew, anti-Jewish. But if you go to what Semite means all the way back in its history, the Semitic people were of Hebrew descent, of Arab descent, we are, you know, we're related. If we get to the twins, we're going to see how closely we're related, okay, with Isaac and Esau, because out of Esau comes the Arab nations, out of Isaac comes the, the Jewish nations. So we're very closely related. And Semitic, when you're studying Semitic languages, you're studying Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, uh, and some others that are mixed in with that also. The scriptures were written in Hebrew and in Aramaic, and then in Greek, because Greece became the world like English is of today. So um, that's your languages, but your peoples, um, we kind of by today call mostly, the, of today, the Semitic, we think Jewish. But go back and you're going to see the mix. Okay, and that was a good question last week that I think I derailed before I fully answered. I thought of it Wednesday night. So, and this fits here also because the Greeks called the area Aram, they called it Syria. The people from Shem's line, one of the three sons of Noah, Shem's line, he had a son named Aram. That's probably also how this area became known as Aramaean because of him. That's Genesis 10.22 if you want to go back and look at it again. And they spread widely in Syria, in the Mesopotamia area. They became a strong people, and they are known as a Semitic people, or the Semites. That comes from Shem's line, and it follows on down. Uh, now, Rebecca, Rivka, she is known as a Syrian, um, or an Aramean. You know, Syria, uh, and as Syria is that area, so we're just using different names. I'm a Californian, I'm an American, it's that same sort of idea. So they could call themselves a Syrian or an Aramean. Um, Jacob's called a Syrian in Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 5. Um, Avraham, because he came from that same family, was known as a Syrian or an Aramean. Either you could use them interchangeably. But not to throw a monkey wrench in here, the people called Syrian today are from that little country called Syria today. So they're not the people that we're talking about here. That's why you, uh, you hear me stress so much. Again, when I say a Syrian, it's because they weren't a Syria. That was the northern area that, that later is a nation that's developed that's not there in our storyline at this point. 
but I don't want to confuse you all. I'm hoping I'm not. And again, Padan Aram or Padan Aram, that simply means the field or the plain of Aram. And it's um, the city of Haran, which we think was named after Avraham's brother, is in that area. So all three, Abraham and Nahor and Haran, the three brothers, could easily all be called Aramean, Syrian, Maybe that's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think there's another one in there, but if not. Okay, so that's who we're talking about and where we're talking about that area in particular. So if I haven't confused you, we get the detail <laughs> that that's being stressed that Isaac's wife came from that area. She was Aramean. Verse 21. Yitzhak, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. Why is he praying on her behalf? There's something seriously amiss here. Yeah. Because she was unable to have children. Now, sneak peek, spoiler, <laughs> Isaac is going to be 60 when the twins are born. Do you remember how old he was when he married Rebecca? Rivka? 40. 40. So there's 20 years in there, folks. I think he had a right to go before the Lord and plead and say, why can't my wife get pregnant? Okay? Well, That's, at least he didn't have one from the concubine. At least he didn't step in and have one from a concubine. <laughs> Dora is so right. He, he, maybe he saw the trouble it gave his father. <laughs> Although we're going to see he makes a similar mistake to his dad. So, you know. But when it says that he prayed or he entreated, it was fervently. Okay, verse 26, by the way, tells us the age. Um, verse 26, that Isaac was 60 years old when he gave birth, just to back up and give proof of what I'm saying. Now, the son of the promises of the covenant had to have a seed for the promises to be fulfilled because there's a promise of one coming from Isaac. Isaac wasn't the promised seed as in Messiah, he was the promised seed from the line that would bring forth the Messiah. But we knew, you know, that we're looking all the way down. That Abraham would have a son, but there we're going down the line before we're going to get to Messiah. And he was told, Abraham was told he'd be a great nation. One son wouldn't be a great nation. But many sons and many peoples, we've got ourselves a great nation. So to see that covenant fulfilled, to see the promises fulfilled, Isaac knows, i got to have an offspring here. We've got a problem, Lord. The same way I think <laughs> Abraham felt when he did go before the Lord and say, is my servant Eliezer to receive all from my household and to be the one counted? And God said, no, the one who will come from your own loins, not from, your, from just servant in your household, but from your own loins, that's the one who will be the promised seed. Now Isaac's going before the Lord and saying, there's got to be progeny. I've got to have children here. We need some help here. And we see that God at work is showing that the seed of the promises always seem to be prayed for. We're going to see that as I give you a few names in Scripture in a moment. I believe what God was doing was showing it's not just the natural thing that happens. We know people get married and they have babies. This is all natural. But God is showing the supernatural hand. He's showing that he is involved. He's showing in a way that it's a miraculous happening. It's not just the fruit of nature. So if you've got a barren woman, you've got Sarah, the first one at 90 years of age, barren, nobody would have expected her to have a child and even be able to carry that child, deliver that child, and, and raise that child, and yet God enabled Sarah, brought back her, her, her fertility and her husband's also. Now Isaac is also going to see it's not just because we got married and I got a gal here. God's going to step in and he's going to bring forth the fruit. And so we see it even carried on with Rachel, which is the line that, that goes down to the promised Messiah, that uh, she had trouble with pregnancy, getting pregnant, and Hannah, who um, we have the great first prophet Samuel come from Hannah. But remember, she was before the Lord in agony over her inability to have any children and wanted to dedicate the first to the Lord and followed through with what she had said. So each one we see conceived an answer to prayer. 
each one we see God showing it's his intervention in their line in their life that's bringing about the seed as it goes down this is a special line this is not just boy meets girl come together offspring there's more to it than just that in our picture so the promises are already made by God but he's wanting them to realize the promises fulfilled are because God is faithful to his word and God is doing it. In that same way, God tells us to pray today when we have needs. He tells us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known. And it goes on and tells us that the one who knows will fulfill. Let's, let's look at it. It's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Let me give it to you. Yeah, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. I start quoting... Uh, in verse 6, but let me go ahead and read it in, in its entirety to you. Um, I looked at the wrong verse, sorry. Yes, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications when you're really, you're just, you're, you're sobbing it out. You can't even hardly put it into words, your whole heart's in it. And you're to be praying in that way with thanksgiving. Thankful the Lord hears. Thankful the Lord answers. Let your requests be made known to God. And the shalom of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus. So we're being told in those verses, bring everything to God. Don't be anxious for everything. Pray, pour it out, cry it out to him. But also, at the same time, be thanking him because he is hearing and he's saying, I will answer. And I will answer in a way that's beyond anything you could think, you could imagine, you could comprehend. I will also guard your heart and your mind. I believe in that is where our anxiety goes away. Because when our heart is, our mind is on him, Isaiah 26, 3 says, when our mind is focused on him, then we have that perfect peace. This is what God was offering. He offered it to Yitzhak. He offered it to Abraham. He's offering it to us today. And I love the two extra words my dad would put in. He, the, the version he used would say, um, the peace of God which passes all understanding. He would add in the words, and all misunderstanding. If you are misunderstanding, God's still faithful, and he is still answering, and he still is doing. And I, I like that. Romans 8.32, on our way back slightly we're going back toward uh, Genesis but we'll stop off at Romans 8 32 and if you ever need your faith strengthened read Romans 8 read it from the beginning and by the time you get to the end and that crescendo of nothing can separate us from the love of God you should be encouraged but stopping off at verse 32 it says he who did not spare his own son but delivered him over it for us all how will he not also with him freely give us all things how could Jehovah the Father and Yeshua the Son not give us all things when he already gave us everything in his Son, in the shed blood of his Son? That's where we can say in our Hebrew, Dayenu, it would have been enough if he did nothing else but that. I would praise God for my salvation and know I'm home one day in heaven with him on basis of that shed blood. But he's saying, I, I so freely gave you everything my entire life. When am I going to stop short of giving to you now? How am I going to let you down so to speak and remember anytime you feel let down it's on your end of misunderstanding because God is faithful and he never does um, never lets us down never abandons us never forsakes us never doesn't keep his promise it may not be your timing and it may not be the way you think but who knows best I know we all know the answer to that verse 22 so, I, I, Yitzhak in verse 21, did I read all of 21? No, I didn't. I got to read 21 to you. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. We got that part. We got it was because she was able to have children, but notice the rest of the verse. And the Lord answered him, and his wife, Rebecca, Rivka, conceived. God heard, God answered his prayer. But, verse 22, the children struggled together with her, within her, and said, and by the way, notice, God not only answered, he double blessed. He's put twins within Rebecca. Uh, but the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is so, why am I in this condition? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Okay, that shows us her character. 
Rivka was also a spiritual woman. She also had a walk of faith with the Lord and a prayer life with the Lord, and she sought answers from the Lord. It might have even been that she went to the altar that had been set up there and, and the place where everything was dedicated to the Lord, Yitzhak, maybe where he had even uh, been almost sacrificed. Who knows where she went, if she went to an altar, or she just prayed it in her tent, whatever her whole intent, she turned to the Lord for the answer right place to be and she was saying if, if this is so if you've given me this the fruit of my womb then what on earth is going on you see she didn't know she was she was having twins she didn't know she's having twins and all she knows is there is something going on she <laughs> she's in pain she's being kicked and and uh, she's just having a tough time within her. She knew she was pregnant, but she knew this just doesn't seem right. There's something more going on here, and, and she was right. because. Uh, and even if she did know it, I don't believe she did know, but it does say that the children struggle together within her. Even if she did somehow know, I think it's when God told her right now. She's inquired of the Lord in verse 23. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Hmm. Very interesting, very prophetic, and very proleptic, telling it as it is, as if it already happened. The two nations. We know that's going to be fulfilled out of the line of Esau. If you call him Esau. We're going to have the Edomites. We'll see what, when he gets that name Edom. And we'll see that the Edomites and the others that come from the Edomites, and that's your Arab people today, that they came from Esau. And the Jews, the Jewish people today, the Israelis, come from Jacob, from Yaakov. So this is two nations. We see it to this day. And it's, again, further fulfillment of chapter 17 and verse 16. Genesis 17 and verse 16 where I read, because God keeps his word, and I want you to see it. God's speaking to Abraham, and he says to him, I will bless her. Um, actually, this is about Sarah. He's telling Abraham, though. Mm -hmm. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, plural. Kings of peoples will come from her. And we know even from Ishmael, and Isaac, that happened. Ishmael also is a precursor to the Arab nations. It's going to be carried down to the next generation, carried on with Esau. And we're also going to see Isaac's line carried on from Yaakov. And both are going to be nations. Both are going to have tribes. Both are going to have princes. So it's, again, just another complete fulfillment of what God said. I will make of you a great people, many people, and a great nation. The nation that, that God's referring to there is through the, the godly line and the promised line would be the, the Jewish line. So back in 25, two peoples, whoops, I didn't get back to 25. Let's try again. There we go. Two peoples or two manners of people are within you. So he's God's telling Rivka what's going on in her womb. And he's basically saying you got two totally different people. They are opposite of each other and they have antagonistic temperaments and we see that through their lives they're always at it with each other they are not in agreement so she didn't have two little sweet ones she had two headstrong and they probably were already fighting in the womb if anyone doesn't think life starts at conception here's proof mm -hmm. and anybody who's carried a baby knows there's life long before the moment of delivery in fact if you don't feel life they know that, that there is no life, you know, and that there's a major problem. One people will be stronger. That's going to be fulfilled in, in the scripture many a time we're going to see. The Edomites that come from this line that we've been talking about, they're subjected to the house of David. Now the house of David, the house of David, that comes from Yaakov, from Jacob's line. So let me show you a couple places that show the Edomites in subjection to the Israelites. Okay, go with me to 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, and we're going to go to chapter 8 and verse 14. 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, chapter 8 and verse 14. Samuel happens to be the one that I referenced just short ago that Hannah, Hannah, 
prayed fervently for a son that she could dedicate to the Lord, and God gave her her desire. And he grew up in the temple in total consecration to the Lord and under the tutelage of Eli. Of course, God calling him and having his hand on him, Samuel raises up to be a great prophet in the land of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 14 we read, He put garrisons in Edom. In all Edom he put garrisons. Garrisons are... Um, they're like a fencing, a, an area that they're within. Okay, it's a, it's a stronghold, but it's a, it's a, they go this far. That's where they are. So he made garrisons out of them. That, and all the Edomites became servants to David. And the Lord helped David wherever he went. So the Edomites were basically told where they would, could go, and they were being controlled by the house of David. He, he had the upper hand. We see this fulfilled in the time of Amaziah, uh, uh, um, in, in Messiah, I think you say Amaziah, Amaziah. Go with me to Second Kings, and then you can pronounce it however you do, okay? Second Kings, Second Kings now, yes. Can we let go of, of, uh, Second Samuel. Second Samuel. You can let go of Second Samuel. I'm just showing you that the Edomites were in subjection to the house of David in, in Samuel, and now in Second Kings chapter 14, we're going to read in verse 1. In the second year of Joash, of son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, became king. So when Amaziah was king, we've got all our, our Israel names here. We know um, actually he's king of Judah. Um, when that's going on, drop down to verse 7. And it says, he killed of Edom in the Valley of Salt 10,000 and took Selah by war and named it Jokthiel to this day. Notice he killed those of Edom in the valley. Amaziah had power over the Edomites in that valley. He killed them. He, he ended them at that point. When we fast forward all the way in our future and we look at the millennium, we look at a time just prior to the millennium called the tribulation, and we see that that Malachi, Malachi, his um, he makes a judgment against Esau's descendants and blessings for Jacob that will be fulfilled in that millennial period. Let me show you in Malachi, as you call it, Malachi in our Hebrew. Um, for us in our English version, this is the last book of the original covenant. It's not the case in the Hebrew Bible, but it's the same contents, just a different order. And in Malachi, Malachi chapter 1 and verse 1, it tells us that the word of the Lord to Israel was being spoken through Malachi. Verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I've loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. I've made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says, we've been beaten down, but we will return and we'll build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. Men will call them the wicked territory, the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. So we see contention and war between the Edomites, the Arabs who are coming against Israel, who are saying, we're going to build up, we're going to come back, this is going to be ours. And God said, you might build up, but I'll squash you again. And you might build up, but I'll squash you again. And all through forever, these in particular, not all Arab nations, because we have the Egyptians coming up during the millennium receiving blessing. We have other nations that are mentioned. But there are some that will never rebuild, that they are always in subjection to Israel, head nation during the millennial kingdom. So we see it in Samuel's day. We see it in the kings of Judah, which is just a little down from Samuel. We see it foretold for what will be happening during, through the tribulation and into the millennial period, that the Edomites will be subjected or finished off, and Israel will rise up. Now, let me explain something here because people look at this sometimes and they say, how can God hate? God is a God of love. How can he hate? And what does he mean when he's saying he hates Esau? 
And they'll say, is that even fair? Well, number one, don't ever think you can put your finger into God's eye and tell him what's fair or what's not, what's just or what's not, if you don't understand that the problem is on your end. But when we look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew gives us a better understanding of what's meant. And again, it's called an idiom. It's language idioms. They, they are expressions that are conveying something. And what God is doing here is he's expressing he has such a great love for Yaakov, for Jacob, for the spiritual side, for the, the ones who will be in that line is Messiah, bring the Messiah, the promises of Messiah, the fulfillment of everything God has said, that he has such love for, for that, that in comparison it's like hatred for Edom, for the ones that are warring against, for, and, and not for a certain people, but for that spirit that's uh, totally against God and his people and his promise. It's one such a love that it makes the other one look like a hate. So we don't say, see and say in this, oh, Esau was condemned, Esau never had a chance, Esau goes to hell and it's God's fault. No, you can never say that. So that's not what God's saying. Even as we already saw, Ishmael was not God's choice. Ishmael was sent out. Yitzhak stayed in the house, received the blessings, and goes down. But when Ishmael was buried, where did he go? To his father's people. We saw that that showed he had faith in God. So Esau, I'm not condemning him, but the love for Jacob, and we're going to see he represented the spiritual and the spiritual seed. So that love was so great that this is an enemy of that. It was as if God's love so great, hate is what's over here. Just an, a comparison. Would we know the love in the depth we know it if we didn't know the opposite? No, we really wouldn't. We don't know how white white is till you put it up against black. And wow, then you see how white white is. And you can even call out what isn't white. Oh, that's creamy or that's off-white. But you can see the difference because of the contrast. That's what's being said. Because God so loved the world that he was not willing that any should perish. So no one's condemned, cut off, has no chance. God has always made it available for them. But who is he going to love? Those who are his spiritually. Those are the ones that, that are brought in into that oneness with the Lord. So I hope that helps you understand it. Let me give you a little example from Yeshua's own words. Go with me real quick to Luke and we want to go to Luke chapter 14. And this is Yeshua speaking. And again, people struggle with this when they just pull it out of context. Chapter 14, verse 26. Yeshua says, If anyone comes to me, if anyone comes to Jesus, and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my Talmud, my disciple. He can't follow me. Now, did the Lord literally mean you're to hate your mom, you're to hate your dad, you're to hate your brothers and sisters, and you're even to hate yourself? When you get good at all that, when you really hate everybody and everything, including yourself, then there's value in you to follow me. Of course not. That's not what he was saying. But if you're going to say, Lord, I want to serve you, but I want to go do this with my folks, and, and I want to go do that, and you're caught up with these other things with others that you're putting them before God, then you're not ready to be his follower. Because to be his follower, you have to lay down your life. You have to give yourself carte blanche to the Lord and allow him to mold you and make you. Romans 12 says we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is only our reasonable service. So anything that is in the way is what Yeshua is referring to. There are those who said, well, let me bury my parents first. And you would think the Lord would say, well, that's honorable, because remember he said in the commandments, honor your father and mother. So you would think he'd say that's honorable, and instead he'd say, if you put your hand to the plow and you turn back, you're not worthy of me. What he was saying is, if you put anything else before me, anything else up on a pedestal, it wasn't meaning that they needed to be buried and the Lord wasn't giving them time to bury. They were coming up with excuses. Oh, I want to follow you, Lord, uh, but first let me do this. 
oh yeah I really mean business Lord all of it I'm gonna give you everything oh but um, I'll do it tomorrow <laughs> you know or, or let me take care of this first or well, I got this little hidden thing that I just really like and I don't want to give that up and I know you wouldn't like it so you know I'll, I'll get there I, I'm cleaning myself up anything is is that that tug that pulls us away that's not pleasing to the Lord and that's what the Lord is referring to he's not meaning literally hate your parents he told them honor your parents how could he say hate in that way it, you have to understand what he's meaning so um, again almost like you you don't care about your family you care so much about the Lord that when you're caring about the Lord what does he tell you to do take care of your family it's just like us saying let me pray about it and I'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> let me pray about it and I'll tell you tomorrow yes now there are times we do in wisdom say before I give you an answer let me pray about it but yes if that's the excuse yes tomorrow never comes let me yeah. think about it. Rhonda let me pray about it <laughs> so the hate in uh, Genesis and the hate here I, I know Genesis is Hebrew and um, Luke is uh, Greek but it's a is it the same hate word? It's the same concept, the same idea. I could look up a Hebrew version of Luke and find out whether it's the same word or not. I, I have not done that. Um, I do believe the Gospels were originally written in Hebrew, maybe also Greek, because Greek is prevalent and it's the Greek ones that we have today. But I can't believe that, especially Matthew written by Hebrew, uh, about the Hebrews, to the Hebrews, would be totally in Greek when he needed to be in Hebrew to communicate with the people. So um, whether we have all of those manuscripts from origination or not is the issue. But um, I can guarantee you that the, the idea that both languages are trying to express is the very same idea. It's just you are right, we've crossed in another language. Uh, I didn't realize uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament were both Hebrew. I always understood the New Testament was <coughs> Greek. The, the, so, the best manuscripts that we have are the Greek manuscripts in, in the Hebrew, in the um, British Ahadashah, the New Covenant. Um, especially when you get into Paul's letters, and Paul's letters were written to the Greek speaking world, to the, the Philippians, that's Philippi, to Thessaloniki, that's the Thessalonians, they were Greek. So those especially. But I think originally, like I say, whether we have copies today or not, I think originally. God also had the the Gospels written in Hebrew, at least Matthew, but I think even more than that. Maybe John wasn't, because John's whole thrust was the Greek world to help them understand the Logos, the Word of God. So maybe not, but, but I again, I'm going to defend Matthew and say, how could a Hebrew writing to the Hebrews about the, the Hebrew life not put it in Hebrew? Argument out of silence, I can't say here's the Hebrew manuscript, but I believe originally it was there. And it held to authenticity for all the, the Gospels to be written to show that they agreed, that they weren't being, you know, a different language conveying something else. Um, I believe God saw to it that all Scripture was written in the languages that He chose because they do give the best chance to get that full understanding. Like English is a very poor language. I have one word for love in English, so I'm going to tell you I love chocolate cake, and I'm going to tell you I love my mother. And if you think those two loves are the same, <laughs> you're seriously in trouble. But in Greek, we have more words for love. We know the three main words. In Hebrew, for faith, we've got eight words for faith, and we see different aspects of that faith in each word. So God saw too that the languages that were the richest in, in being able to convey the depth of his word was what it was written in. What we're privileged to hold mainly in the Gospels today is Greek manuscripts that show us how it's not been passed down and twisted, how it's what it was back in that time. But I believe that there were, I know there's fragments that have been found, and I believe there's enough evidence to go out on that limb and say they were also written in Hebrew. And there was argument that could have been right there. Well, you're not saying the same thing, and no, there's no argument. It is the same. Word of God stands true. Um, but yes, when we cross the line, and honestly, I'll be 
open and honest too. When I study in depth, I find it very hard to find more of my Hebrew background and meanings in the sources that are the usual, you know, the, the chosen of today. I have to find the ones that go back that have the mastery of Hebrew also who bring it to me. But like the Septuagint, that's the Greek form of the Hebrew scriptures. It was first written in Hebrew, then it was translated into Greek, and that's the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the original, the Old Testament scriptures. But it was written in Greek to get it to the more of the people of that time. That's Alexander's time. That's in, in the, um, uh, is it as late as the 3rd century? Could be, could be. No, thir yeah, yeah, about the 300s, I believe, if I'm remembering right. But, but again, I believe in the hands of the people who needed it in Hebrew, it was there in Hebrew. So, and I, I do try to get to those sources. I've got some very good sources that are up here that I try to hold on and follow and understand to bring out to you. So, um, so Luke would, and, and Luke everybody argues and says he was Gentile. I think he was Jutile. I think he had a background also. Um, just doesn't fit to me that every other author of the scripture is of that Jewish background and one Gentile? Really? Really? And there's plenty of mix in that time to see a Greek speaking Jew? Oh yeah, yeah, they, they were, um, there's a whole word for it, it'll come to me in a moment, the Greek speaking Jews, Hellenistic. So, um, very common. So again, I could see Luke having command of Hebrew and Greek and easily writing in both. Just. And what's the odds of people that have found uh, all this uh, scriptures now that are the same as way back then? Mm -hmm. Exactly. If it were not inerrant and kept by God, it would not be. And the scenes, especially in Yeshua Jesus' day, kept many, many of our scriptures and our fragments. The Dead Sea Scrolls are just one small area of what they saved and preserved and wrote and, and kept and wow they're finding more of that all the time and I am fascinated. I could probably spend about a thousand years just studying what those seeing scriptures are and their books to help understand it at that time and I still have more to learn and study. So, But, uh, but to my knowledge Rhonda, yes, even though we're talking two different languages it, it is conveying the exact same word, you know, that level of love, not a different one. So, that's so that it fits. Okay, we struggle with all this, don't we? I'll love answers when I get home to heaven. <laughs> and can ask, can you imagine going up to Rivka and saying, you know, we read about your pregnancy. <laughs> that must have been pretty wild. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't even get any sleep. You know, I laugh because I think of my niece who's had two little girls now. Her second one's just six weeks old. And both pregnancies were very different. Her first was very easy. Not that the second was a bad pregnancy. It wasn't. But the second one, her baby was constantly kicking her and waking her up at night. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, okay, let's put those two in that womb of Rivka, and we got an idea of what it was like. But So here we go now, going back on. We've got our two nations, our two manners of people, um, their temperaments. We have that one people will be stronger than the other, and we see that Edomites are the weaker. They are put down, and the, the, um, the Jewish side, the House of David, is what's raised up. Now notice especially the older will serve the younger. I could imagine Rivka even saying, um, excuse me, could you repeat that? Because what's the norm? The older is the one in head position, and the younger is subservient to the older. But here we see God choosing, and God chose according to the foreknowledge that he had. He knew who was in the womb. He knew what they were going to be like, and he knew their hearts. And this is going to be critically important. I'll explain why in a moment, but let me just tell you, many times in Scripture, the firstborn is set aside for one to be chosen who was closer to God's own heart. Okay? Abraham was not the oldest out of the three boys. Remember Nahor, Haran, and Abraham? Abraham's the youngest. Um, Yitzhak 
is not Abraham's oldest. Reuben, when you get to the 12 tribes, he gets set aside and Judah gets that first place position. And Joseph, he was blessed even though he was the youngest of, of his family also, or almost, Benjamin comes down below him, but out of the 12, he's 11th out of 12, and David, the one who sits on the throne, he was the youngest. There were seven others. They were all paraded out. Oh, you, one of our, mine are, is to be king. It's got to be Heman one, Heman number two, Heman number three. And God kept saying, no, no, no. Well, I do have one more son. He's, he's just not that much. And he's out in the field, you know, being the shepherd, which wasn't the high position. And, you know, but go call him in. And God says, that's my one. And his son, Shlomo, Solomon, who follows him, was not the oldest. God does not go by man's way of thinking. He intervenes into man's plans many a time. And again, he's going to choose on the basis of the hearts. He knows what those hearts are going to be like. He's not choosing and they have to be. He's choosing knowing and working and even, even he creates them. He creates, we're told as the potter, you know, he can create the vessel for honor or for dishonor. He'll use it in the manner that, uh, that is his choice. He's sovereign. But I see him saying, I know this one. I know this heart will be a heart for the spiritual. I know this one. This heart's not going to be for the spiritual. So when we're talking about the one who's going to be the spiritual head of Avraham's family, carrying that down how critically important is it that this one be one who's got a heart for God be one who is spiritual and one who is going to be listening to God everything's critical honestly jumping way ahead in our story but I think you all know it can you imagine Esau calling out spiritual decisions for the family can you imagine where the line would end up not where it did I can guarantee you but all they're told at this point is that fact, the older will serve the younger. This is something Rebecca took to heart. This is something she remembered. I'm sure she conveyed it to her husband. There's not a scripture verse that tells me that. But as the story goes on, I cannot believe that she did not. And I'll even show you why I think Isaac knew it even when he wasn't following it. I think he knew it. And I'll show that as we come to it. But right now, ugh. We won't get anywhere near that today. That's another coming lesson. But let's see how far we can get. We've got a little more time. So, so is that how come she decided she was going to help it along because before anything else happened? I'll give you an A-plus for your sneak peek. Yeah, the same way that Sarah tried to help you know, God with Hagar. You know, here, Abraham, you got to have a seed. It's not coming from me. Look, take my handmaid. It'll be as good as mine. I think yes. Re Rebecca said, "I gotta help. I gotta get in here. I gotta yeah, fix it." We know. I mean, really, who is? If you have family, who's what? Although we love them, but we know who can <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. And there you go with your love word, and you're right on track. Yes. Yeah. So we'll get there eventually, but we're going to lead up to the days of her delivery in verse 24. They were at the end, so it's nine months later. Behold. There were twins in her womb. Remember, they didn't have ultrasound back then. They couldn't say, oh, hey, we see a little something here, and then we see another little something here, and these two are in two different bodies. They're not connected. We've got two different something going on. No. God ultrasound. I'm sorry? God has an ultrasound. Well, God also brings the fruit of the womb. <laughs> so, yes, yes, God's an ultrasound. But the, there's twins in her womb. And so she's going to deliver the twins, verse 25. Now the first came out red. Hebrew says reddish or reddish and, and all over like a hairy garment. So first one came out with all kinds of hair all over. Esau in Hebrew means hairy. It also means rough. Look at chapter 27 and verse 11. Genesis 27 and verse 11. Genesis 27, Bereshit 27, and verse 11. And there we have Yaakov, Jacob answered his mother, Rivka, Rebekah, 
Behold, Esau, my brother, he's a hairy man and I'm a smooth man, <laughs> okay? There was a difference. We've seen that. We've seen that some have lots of rough, you know, hair all over their, their bodies and others that, that the chest is bare, you know, and others look almost like a monkey, <laughs> okay? Not meaning anything, just, just saying. So Esau came out hairy and that's why he gets named Harry. And he also proves to be a man of the earth, a natural man. We're told that about Kion, Cain, in contrast with Aval. Remember Abel? He took the flock, the sheep, he brought that to the Lord, and Kion was a man of the land. I'm going to bring the first fruits of what I've done, my best. I'm going to bring that to God. Um, Herod seems to be in scripture, and I'm going to sneeze, sorry. It seems to be a sign of a, um, of a wildness, an earthiness, uh, um, excessively sensual. He, he was a he-man, okay? Masculinity. Masculinity. There you go, yes, yes. And who's held up even today is those masculine, rough he-men. They see a man that's gentle and soft and, and seems meek and mild and they don't respect him in the same way. So Esau had that all going for him right from birth. Harry and, and he gets named that and he's, he's just rough, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. They Oh, and they named him Esau, sorry, because Esau means hairy or rough, okay? Verse 26, afterward his brother came out with his hand holding onto Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, Jacob. Okay, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to tell you because of the time. I'm going to give you some background and all that goes into this, but we'll go in next week in, into more depth into the meaning of the name and all of that because it is so misused today. It opens the door to anti Semitism. I've heard it again and again and again that I, I really want to teach you what's the word, strongly against it, I want to give you the Hebrew, and I want to give you everything that's here, but I'll start it right now. Notice how his brother came out with his hand holding onto Esau's heel, okay? This birth of the twins, it was not any time in between. I got a, a one who is equal to a doctor on here that I think can attest with me that that's rare, but it does happen. Usually there's a, at least a few minutes in between, and sometimes even I've been told there's an hour in between the birth of two that are still considered twins. I know there's been enough time that one's been born on December 31st and one's been born on January 1st, and, and it makes a big spread between them. But there was no time. These two were born, can I use the word maybe simultaneously? The one's got a hold of the other. There's no space in between. Can I give you my, my medical yes. experience? Yes, you can. <laughs> they must, okay, they must have been in the same set. Okay, okay. Because if you're in a different set, you're separated from this person. And if they, he comes up holding, they have to be in the same set. Okay, Thank okay. I I'll agree. agree. Okay. Rowena, do you have any problem with that? <laughs> I was just reading scriptures, but it says the first came forth, and then afterward his brother came forth. Because I've never seen um, two heads coming out at the same time. No, and they did a not. normal spontaneous delivery. Right, right. No, there's a head here, and there's a head down here, because what comes behind the head is the body and then the feet. So, yes, you could see them. That's why I said, can I use the word simultaneously? You, you see them, mm -hmm. you know, you, it definitely was not two heads coming out of the womb at the same moment. No. Esau's head was born first, his body followed, but right on his heel is Jacob's hand, and then Jacob's head and his body, because he was grabbing hold of the heel. Who was the one that their hand came out and went back in? That's the twins that um, Judas, Judah's wife had, Tamar. Tamar, yeah, a red scarlet to say yeah. which was first because the first thing that came out of the womb, they wanted to declare that one was firstborn. So there's a time also where the two, there's a time also where the two were born very, very quickly in succession. I think it's uh, Judah, Judah and Tamar. I think it was Tamar's two. 
Uzziah. Oh, I have to look it up. But uh, uh, and, and that would have been like a difficult delivery for the second, because usually when the hands come up first, the doctor tries to put it back, because otherwise you'll have a shoulder presentation which should cause injury to the shoulders. Okay. <laughs> Okay, very good. So Can usually the doctor will push back the baby so that the head comes out instead of the hand. And but that makes then. all the sense in the world, yes. Did they know that back then? Well, <laughs> I'm sure by, by things that happened, yes, they would have more knowledge, you know, and they would realize but, it. And the hand was drawn back in, whether it was pushed back in by the midwife or whether God saw the hand that, came, that went back in that had the scarlet thread on it. It did oh, so go he, back. He grabbed in. the heel, then they put the scarlet thread around? No, no, no. About the so scarlet right. thread is another twin's birth. Right, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's another twin's that birth. I got asked a question over here. And, and Rochelle? And his daughter-in-law? Yes, Lorna. Yeah, what? You know, in modern days, we have uh, C-section, cesarean. If they open up, they will come out at the same time, don't they? <laughs> well, they still bring out one baby, and then they bring out the other baby. They, they, there literally is still an order. And, and I'm not saying anything against that. Esau is the oldest. He was born first. If we were to, timing it to say like we do now, okay, my little, my great niece, my little newest to our family, was born at 11, 11 p.m. That one's going to be easy to remember. <laughs> it would be as if the second one would have been born probably 11, 12 p.m. But usually there's a little bit more time in between than that. And really, depending on how fast, it almost could have been in that same minute is what we're saying. It just, it was, he was literally follow, falling on the heels of the other, following on the heels of the other. Even when we use that expression today, if somebody's following on their heels, they're right on top of them. There's not space in between. They're just nipping right at their, their feet. And that basically is what Yaakov was doing. He was grabbing hold of that heel. Now, how much he understood, I don't know. Did he realize, hey, my brother's going, I want to go too? Was it the, the push that's natural, that's bringing the baby forth? He was in the canal and he's just coming also. Whatever the point is, Esau was born first. He's named Red, Harry. I'm sorry, he's named Harry because he's Harry. And Yaakov is going to be named Heel Grabber. Okay, he'll catch her. That's what Yaakov means. Because he was grasping the heel of Esau. That's how they got named in that day. They, they didn't say, well, I'm going to name after my great-great-grandfather. Or, I've always liked this name. The names had meaning for what was going on with, with what was going on. Isaac brought laughter into the home. God told him you'll name him Isaac. God often named the babies. The people didn't have to go through nine months of fighting over it like my, my niece and her husband did this time. It, it's just what I want you to see is the origination and the original meaning what it was. Now, it's come to have another connotation. We'll see Esau use that. But as we go through this, I'm going to give you um, more behind the scenes of what the names mean and even when you hear and and i'll repeat this because we're at 3 30 i've already lost a couple people um even when you hear the word oh it means supplanter now today if you're called a, su a supplanter you're 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 uprooting somebody and taking their spot that's a supplanter that's today but supplanter back then and today it means supersede and replace but supplanter back then was subplanta. And those two words were under the sole of the foot. Well, where was Yaakov? Under the sole of Esau's foot. So when, he's, when it's said that his name means supplanter, you can't put into it what supplanter means today. You have to know what it meant then. When you go back into the language, that's what it meant. Sub under planta the sole of the foot and in hebrew we've got another word very close to that that's akev in our hebrew and that means heel akev and yaakov do you hear how close those are heel catcher came off of the heel he was grasping the heel he was under the sole of the, the foot of the one that gave that name supplanter or that meaning supplanter 
in all of that, where do you see it saying, oh, Jacob's bad. He's a deceiver. He's always trying to get what's his brother's, and it goes on and on. That's what, if you haven't heard it, I'll introduce you to that world next week. And again, I will show you some other um, comments from the language and from what transpires as to what really is the meaning of the name Yaakov and what we should see of his character. Because I will warn you, before you anathemize a character in the Bible, look and see what God does with that character. Does God anathemize that person? I'll tell you another one, because I don't want to get into Jacob so far, I'm just going to be repeating. Elijah, Eliyahu, is shredded. When is he shredded? When he ran from Jezebel. What happened just before he ran from Jezebel? Anyone remember? He, he was depressed. Yeah, right, just before the depression, I'm going back a tiny bit further than Lorna to what Ann and Dora are saying over here. He took on the prophets of Baal. He slew, what was it, 700 in, in a day. He had called down fire out of heaven. Remember he had told them, make your altar, have your God call out fire. And he gave them a chance, and they did everything they could, and he poked fun at them. and you know. But yeah, it was an emotionally triggered day. Then he had his altar put, his sacrifice on the altar, had him soak the sacrifice, make a moat, all this water around, because what's not going to catch fire? Something that's soft and wet. I saw people, sadly, but I saw people last night on the news, they showed the picture in Lahaina. These people literally jumped into the swimming pool at, at the resort they, that they were at, that... They took their cell phones and they showed all around all of the hotel buildings, or whatever you want to call it, all the way around, north, south, east, and west, all were on fire. They had jumped into that pool to save their lives, and it did save their lives because they got in the middle of the pool and that water did not burn. So Elijah's making it impossible. Then he calls out fire from heaven and immediately, because God's showing he is the one true and living God, remember the, the Baal God is a dead God. He can't answer. And all of this power goes out so that he is able to slay all of those prophets that were of Baal. Now, if you've ever gone through a day like that, you're high on energy. But what happens after a high on energy? <laughs> You have that equal and opposite reaction. And you are low, you are worn out, you are done. And as Lorna said, depression can even set in. You're just worn out, you're discouraged. Often, when we have a huge spiritual battle that we win, pray for them in the next few days because you'll see them go through a battle. You'll see them worn out. In that exhaustion, he hears Jezebel wants to kill him. And he just felt like he couldn't face another thing. And so he ran. And notice what God did. God let him go. God gave him the ability to go for 40 days and 40 nights. God fed him. God slept him. Then God showed him his power and said, What's your problem, Elijah? <laughs> Get back into the fight. You got, you're doing it in the power of your God, not in your might. But notice how God didn't shred Elijah and didn't take him to task. He was very gentle and in a very quiet, a very still, small voice after showing the power. He spoke to Elijah's heart, encouraged him, and sent him back in. And oh, by the way, guess when Elisha came into the picture? Right then. He sent him back in with a helper. That's the mercy of our God. I see the same thing here. Don't shred Jacob. And there are so many that do. Oh, the, the sermons I've heard that talk about his horrible character and who he was and how he got what he deserved and on and on and on. Let's look at what the scriptures say. Let's take it to, to heart what God says. And I'll encourage you in your homework this week, go read this story so you're fresh on the details and find me where God says, I'm upset with you, Jacob. You are a bad person. You're a deceiver and you're doing everything, da, 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 da. Where does God go after his character? And if you're smart enough to catch my next thought, there's someone else highly involved. Somebody even mentioned her earlier. Oops, I just gave you a huge hint. <laughs> but look for where God judges her. And bring back those scriptures ready to share them. Okay?
Where That's your challenge. It? Where God, hmm? where, did, where do we read it? Genesis chapter 25. Oh. Right where we are. Just go a little further ahead. Just read through. Go all the way through. Do we need to, I think you may have to get into 26. Just go through the whole story. No, it's all in 25. So just read to the end and study it in a little bit of depth. Think about it as you're reading it. Because one thing we tend to do, we're so familiar with the Bible stories that we tend to miss the forest for the trees. You know, I love when I hear somebody brand new or fairly new in the Lord or a little child that's being introduced to these stories. I love to hear them. I love to hear their takes on them because they pick up things that we've just gotten so common with, so familiar with, that we miss a lot. So go read, read the details, see where God puts judgment See where he doesn't. I think you'll find it very interesting. We'll go through that next week. I keep putting out on my reminders that we're through this part. Sorry, folks. We're just taking a long time to get through it. But hey, you know what? We covered more than nine months because Rivka wasn't pregnant and now she's delivered. So <laughs> we've covered about a year. I don't think we did too bad to cover a year in the class. <laughs> but I trust it's a blessing and encouragement to you, especially because we want to see what God wants us to learn from this. And we're going to see, just as the way that I brought out to you, our anxiousness for nothing. We're going to see so many lessons in this. And again, because it opens the door to a world that goes into anti-Semitism, and because of my background and who I am bringing these scriptures to, you, I will be on my sandbox. I will, I will honestly say that, but I'll be on it from the scripture, from the Hebrew, from its full meaning, and give you all the ammunition you need that the next time you hear someone shred his character, you can say, <clears throat> excuse me. What do you think about, and you can take them on and just see, because if it didn't open the door to so much bad that's done to the people today even, I wouldn't care as much. No, I still would. It's the word of God. You know, I want to see it from his perspective. So may God help us as we handle his scriptures, not to bring ourselves into it, but to see it as he has revealed it to us, because every bit of it is for our learning, for edification and we can apply it so there's where we're gonna go we'll pick up next week starting with what does the name Jacob really mean and what do we see about his character we'll look at the characters of four next week Yitzhak, Rivka, Esau and Yaakov we're gonna look at all four of them their character what they were really like I think you'll find a few surprises okay Questions, comments? Am I dragging it out on you all? Or are you are you saying hurry up, Rochelle? Come on. <laughs> okay, okay. I hope it's good. You know, there are times when I hear someone, and I think, okay, come on, come on. I got your point. Come on. <laughs> and other times when it's slow down. Let me digest this. So I I hope to be you know. Uh, it, are you asking if we have questions about this lesson or questions over? Oh. Obviously, you have a question total. <laughs> okay, I want to know, you know, when the Bible says, at the end times, man will be lovers of themselves. Mm -hmm. Does that mean, like, man standard everybody or just man? I mean, because most, a lot of times it's, it's I mean, man is referred as human. I mean, all of us. It's meaning humankind. It's not meaning every single person without exception. But overall, that's how man would be defined. Do we see that today? Yeah. Yeah. But it's just not man, it's everybody. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the general consensus, the majority of the people are lovers of themselves. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. That was short and quick. I didn't need to close off first. I was ready to say we'll pray and then answer, but that was quick. Any other quick comments, questions? We'll go to prayer and then I'll open the mics again. You know, I'm not cutting you off. I think I've got one that's ready to go to sleep. He will be nameless. <laughs> He's been burning the candle on both ends. He's gotten back from what was to be a break and got forced into all kinds of... Uh, Problems with his his he owns his business employees. And, yeah and employees and 
I don't blame him. And if it's, he's hot like <laughs> I am right now, I'd be asleep if I wasn't talking. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. I'm not seeing anybody interact that they want to get something in first. Lord, thank you for giving us opportunity to really dive into your word and get the depth of the meaning to think and to learn from these people that you've set down as an example before us. Lord, let us learn from them. Let us learn so that we develop the kind of character pleasing unto you so we know how to withstand the evil around us, so we know how to take on trials and, and tribulations and temptations. Lord, we know this is all for our edification also. Thank you for showing us that we can, without being perfect, have such a walk with you that we can be called your friend and that we can see you intervene in the details of our lives. That is not something we merit or earn in any way, but is fully and completely dependent on our God, who is just as faithful as he was to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We praise you, and may we go in the power of your Ruch HaKodesh, accomplishing what you would have us to do this week, ready to come back together and study again, Lord, to learn, to grow, to be more like you and more pleasing to you. We praise you, and oh, we love you, Lord. Can't wait till we're home praising you and, and loving you forever and ever, and we thank you for that promise, too. May we reach many more in the time that's left. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, open up your mics, questions, comments.